motivations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We made this! That's right, friends, for better or worse, despite the predictions, the world didn't end yesterday. Which, among other things, means that those of us who didn't pay our electric bills, tried that greasy three-alarm chili, or thought we didn't need to prepare a sermon, are left in a bit of a lurch. As many of you are well aware, yesterday, May 21st, 2011, was the date on which Harold Camping, the president of the small but vocal family radio, predicted as the end of the world. He came to this conclusion through a series of careful calculations based on a passage from 2 Peter, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. In his mind, this was not a statement about God's eternal nature, as we have understood, but rather a formula that God hid in the scriptures to help us predict the end of the world. So, taking that formula, he went back to Genesis, to the flood story. And when God claims to, and God said to Noah, for yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth until yada 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 kablooey, he claimed that God meant 7,000 years, and camping somehow knew that the exact date on which God spoke to Noah was May 21st, 4,990 B.C. He simply had to add 7,000 years, subtracting one because there was no year zero, apparently, and come up, came up with the date for the end of the world, May 21st, 2011, yesterday. Now, setting aside the fact that by his calculation in the Noah story that when he would have been on the boat for 40,000 days and nights, this is a pretty creative use of the Bible. The challenge, of course, as we have seen throughout history, is that when we attempt to claim secret knowledge of God, biblical or not, someone often gets hurt, including us. And unfortunately, this was no exception. You see, in addition to the billboards, the websites, and the millions of dollars that were donated in earnest to this cause, hundreds of people from all walks of life heard this message and decided to leave their families and friends to proclaim the bad news. In fact, since September, of last year, five separate caravans have been driving all over the country, warning people that the end was not. Now, on the one hand, we might learn something from these people. After all, they believed in something so much that they were willing to sacrifice everything to proclaim it. Certainly, that is something we can admire. But on the other hand, we can't help but feel sorry for a people who put their entire faith in a prediction that turned out to be wrong. But friends, make no mistake, the fallout from this failed prediction was not limited to those driving around in the caravans. No. Unfortunately, the media circus that this story created has provided an already skeptical world with yet another reason to look at those of us who call ourselves Christians and wonder. They wonder how a people could be so focused on the future that they don't pay attention to the needs of the present. They wonder how a people could spend so much on billboards proclaiming death when people don't have enough money to live. In other words, it has given a world who is in desperate need of the good news we have to share yet another reason to tune us out and go about their daily lives. But friends, we have a message that the world still needs to hear. And it wasn't revealed to us through some secret biblical formula, but has been at the core of our faith from the very beginning. 
We have it affirmed in every primary source of our faith, from scripture to tradition to reason to experience. It's a message which serves to chasten those of us who find ourselves wanting to gloat that we are still here on May 22nd. And the message is simply this. There's a difference between not being dead and being alive. Friends, there's a difference between not being dead and being alive. And so today, on this fifth Sunday after Easter, five weeks after we heard the good news of life, the good news of the empty tomb, we pause on our journey toward Pentecost in order to briefly remember the events of Holy Week. For just a moment, we think back to another time in which the followers of Christ were prepared for death, but found life on the other side. And as we do, we listen for three reminders from Jesus himself about what it means to be alive. In many ways, our scripture lesson today is a fitting one. After all, it contains a verse which has also been taken out of context and used to proclaim a misguided message. But rather than avoiding it altogether out of fear, perhaps we would do well to listen to the words with which the chapter begins. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. Believe in God. Believe also in me, or as another translation might put it, believe into God. Believe also into me. As if the act of belief takes us somewhere. So with that hope in mind, let us begin our journey together of belief and listen for three words of life along the way. A word of inclusion, a word of direction, and a word of commission. First, a word of inclusion. In my father's house, there are many words. Now let's get ourselves up to speed. Jesus and his disciples have just shared a meal together. Jesus has disrobed, washed their feet, and reminded them that they are to love one another. He sent Judas away and told Peter that he will deny him three times. The wheels, in other words, are in motion for what will lead to his death and resurrection. But before he goes any further, he turns to his disciples with a final speech. A final lesson before the deed is done. A final bit of knowledge for his followers. And it begins with a message about inclusion. Now, we might do well to remember that the major question of the early church to whom John was writing was about who was to be included. Who was welcome in the faith? Was it Jew or Gentile, male or female, free or slave? In many ways, it's the same question we ask today from our playgrounds to our border rooms. We ask, who belongs, and more importantly, who doesn't? Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. Now, at first, it sounds like he's bragging about the size of his dad's house. <laughs> but as we look into it, we realize that the word house actually implies household. As in, in my Father's family, there are many dwelling places. He continues, if it were not so, but I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is spoken to the disciples in the story written for the early church, but surely meant for us to hear there's a place for us. All of us. Friends, isn't that why we are gathered here today? Because we understand at a core level that on the playground and in the boardroom we may be excluded, but not in the church. The church, the family of God, the household of God includes everyone. We might think of the man who was looking for a new church and walked out after the service saying to the minister, well, I've been looking around for a new church, but everywhere I go, I look around and all I see are a bunch of hypocrites. To which the minister kindly responds, that's the point. In other words, it doesn't matter if we're perfect or imperfect, we are all welcome. In the words
words of Sondheim and Bernstein, there's a place for us. I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> and friends, if we truly want to live, we have to begin with a recognition about who and whose we are. And in case you've forgotten between last week and this week, you are, as I am, a child of God. Young and old, black and white, gay and straight, male and female, we are all children of God. And because of that, we have a place. And so, with that word of inclusion and nourishing us for our journey towards life, we move on towards a word of direction. I am the way and the truth and the life. As we all know, sometimes the directions are clear, but the path itself presents a problem. We might remember the account of the man who stopped for driving 95 miles an hour on the highway. He explained his velocity to the officer by saying, well, I saw a sign that said 95, so I drove 95. When the officer noticed the petrified backseat riders, he said, are you all right? To which one responded, oh, no, we're fine. 995 was okay. We just hope he's not going back to 295. <laughs>
greater works than these. Our text today ends with Jesus promising that we will do greater works than him, saying, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. And at first hearing, it sounds like Jesus is promising to grant our wishes, as if we could just ask for something and it will happen. But anyone who has ever prayed in earnest for the life of a sick loved one knows that. As much as we may want him to be, Jesus is not a genie in a bottle. God has given us freedom to live in this world. And with that freedom comes the ability to choose how we live our lives. The ability to say yes. As we know, sometimes we will make better choices than others. But what Jesus is promising is that he's with us no matter what choice we make. And because of that, we really can do greater works than him. Friends, Jesus was only in ministry for three years. He accomplished a lot, but not everything. There was and is still work to be done in the world. We have each been given gifts to use in the world. And most of us, thank goodness, will have longer than three years in which to use those gifts. We can't help but do greater works than Christ because we can build upon the groundwork that he laid. He showed us the way. The good news for us in this story is that we know how to do it. We've been given a way, and we know what happens. We know that the farewell address for Jesus was not his final goodbye. He wasn't like Moses or the other prophets who throughout the Old Testament said their goodbye, and that was it. No! Something came after his farewell address, and that something was life. Life was on the other side of his farewell, not just for him, but for us. Friends, we are now a part of that after life. Not just because the world didn't end yesterday, but because we are an Easter people. We are the ones charged with carrying his message of life into the world, and that means remembering his words of inclusion, of direction, and of commission in order to create space so that those who come after us can do even greater works than these. Or said another way, there's a difference between not being dead and being alive. So, friends, we can make fun of those who thought the world would end yesterday. But before we do, we should probably ask ourselves in the words of that old Methodist hymn, are we yet alive? When we can answer yes, maybe we should be the ones driving around the world.